right, good afternoon, everyone. I have just a few things at the top, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, first, taking a look at the Middle East region, the department continues to maintain a robust force posture throughout the US, U.S. European Command and U.S. Central Command areas of responsibility to protect U.S. forces, enable our support for the defense of Israel, and to ensure the United States is prepared to respond to various contingencies. As we've discussed previously, U.S. forces in the region include, but aren't limited to, an amphibious ready group and marine expeditionary unit, multiple destroyers, fighter aircraft, and carrier strike group presence. Of note, following a period of dual carrier coverage by the Theodore Roosevelt CSG and the Abraham Lincoln CSG in the CENTCOM region, the Theodore Roosevelt has departed and begun its transit into the Indo-Pacific Command Area of Operations. As we have been since the beginning of the crisis in the Middle East following Hamas's vicious October 7 attacks, we remain intensely focused on working with regional partners to de-escalate tensions and deterring a wider regional conflict. The United States also remains very focused on securing a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal to bring all of the hostages home and to end the war in Gaza. Closer to home, as you may have seen reported, what is now called Tropical Storm Francine made landfall in Louisiana yesterday as a Category 2 hurricane, bringing storm surges, flash, and urban flooding, hurricane force winds, and tornado watches. The governor of Louisiana declared a state emergency earlier this week and brought nearly 3,000 Louisiana National Guardsmen onto state active duty. These Guardsmen, along with 134 high-wheeled vehicles, 65 watercraft, and 32 Army Guard helicopters, were positioned around the state to support response and recovery operations. As of this morning, five parishes are still under mandatory evacuation and more than three, 390,000 homes are without power. For more information about the response and recovery, I would encourage you to reach out to the Louisiana National Guard. And finally, Secretary Austin will travel to Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama tomorrow and will accompany First Lady Dr. Jill Biden to highlight the new universal pre-kindergarten program being implemented at Department of Defense Education Activity Schools. Secretary Austin will also provide remarks at Maxwell to announce the multiple new initiatives in support of his taking care of people effort, emphasizing the department's commitment to the overall well-being and quality of life of our service members and their families. We'll have much more to provide tomorrow, but you can anticipate these new initiatives will be focused on actions that improve the quality of life for our service members, enhance their economic security, support the careers of military spouses, and make moves to new assignments easier. And with that, I'd be glad to take your questions. I'll start with Tara. AP. Thanks, General Rutter. Um, on Ukraine, you've seen in the last day or so, Secretary Blinken say that the door may be opening a little bit to the U.S. considering uh, giving Ukraine more long-range strike options or loosening restrictions. But we heard pretty clearly from Secretary Austin last week that he's not in favor of this. Is that thinking changing? Is the building now considering giving Ukraine more long-range strike options? Yeah, I've uh, certainly seen the press reports on that. Uh, I would tell you uh, there has been no change to our policy. I don't have anything to announce, uh, and certainly if there are any changes, we'll let you know. But as of today, uh, that policy has not changed. What is the primary driver behind Secretary Austin being reluctant to further loosen the restrictions or to provide more long-range options? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, uh, again, th this is our policy, right? And we've, of course, worked with the Ukrainians to ensure that they have the ability to conduct cross-border counterfire uh, defensive strikes uh, to defend their troops that are being attacked from across the border in, in Russia. Um, you know, we are very, very much focused, and we've talked about this before, on ensuring that Ukraine has what it needs to be able to uh, preserve its sovereignty uh, and take back occupied territory. And that's going to continue to be our focus. The bottom line is we want to see Ukraine win in this conflict. Uh, and when they feel uh, that it's time, Ukraine feels that it's time to go to the negotiating table, uh, we want them to do so with as strong a hand as possible. Uh, and, and I would point you to Secretary Austin's comments at Ramstein last week where he highlighted there is no uh, one capability. There is no silver bullet uh, that is going to uh, enable Ukraine to succeed. It's about taking all of the capabilities that they have and employing them, employing them in a way uh, that, that gets them 
uh, closer to success and having that stronger hand uh, at the negotiating table. So uh, again, as this battlefield has evolved, our support to Ukraine has evolved. Um, but again, as of right now, the, the policy has not changed. Uh, I'll just leave it there. Okay, uh, one other topic. Um, on Syria, there are reports that Israel conducted a raid against and obtained some IRGC documents and whatnot in, in Syria. Can you confirm this? Yeah, again, seen those press reports, but I'd refer you to the, the Israelis for any questions about their operations. Thanks. Jennifer. Pat, I have some questions about the M1 Abrams tanks. Um, have they been used on the battlefield in Ukraine, and if so, how many? Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I, I'd refer you to them to talk about where and if they've employed those capabilities. I mean, as you know, we've obviously provided them, uh, helped train them, uh, and provide some remote uh, tele maintenance capability. Uh, but as far as, you know, where and if they've employed them, I'd refer you to them. And do the Ukrainians have permission to use them across the border in Kursk? Uh, well, as I highlighted, I mean, what we've agreed to with the Ukrainians is that they can use U.S. Uh, security assistance to conduct counterfire, uh, you know, defend themselves from potential Russian attacks or actual Russian attacks from across the border. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the capabilities that they're employing, I'd, I'd refer you to them. And overall, are they making a difference? There was a lot of debate at the time when they were being approved. Are the M1 Abrams tanks making a difference? Well, again, you know, I'd I'd kind of take a step back and say, first of all, that's a question that the Ukrainians would have to answer. I would tell you again, though, that it's not about one singular capability. It's about how you take all of the capabilities, whether it be air defense, armor, artillery, uh, and training, and combine all those together to create capabilities that support your strategic and operational objectives. And so certainly we've seen the Ukrainians fight very courageously, very creatively, uh, and, and um, you know, there's no reason to think that it, things are going to change in that regard anytime soon. And separately, on the Hill yesterday, there was a heated hearing on um, U.S. chips, supercomputer chips that have ended up uh, making their way into Russian weapons. Senator Blumenthal hosted the hearing, and four technology companies, including Intel and Texas Instruments, were brought before the hearing. Why? First of all, is the Department of Defense concerned about American technology ending up in Russian weapons still two years, two and a half years into the war? And what can you do to stop it, and why haven't you been able to stop it? Uh, well, you know, broadly speaking, Jennifer, as you know, um, there has been an interagency effort uh, to place sanctions on Russia to prevent those kinds of uh, activities from occurring. So I'd, I'd refer you to my colleagues at, at Commerce uh, to talk more about those particular efforts. Uh, but that's something that the Department of Defense will continue to work closely with our interagency partners to prevent. Because um, again, certainly we don't want to see American technologies being used uh, in places like Ukraine uh, against Ukrainian citizens. Thank you. Constantine. Uh, thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> the USS Roosevelt, you mentioned she's uh, in, chopped into the Indo-Pacific. Is, uh, is it safe to say that she is on her way home? Are you able to say whether she's returning home? Uh, you know, as a, as a matter of policy, Constantine, we're not going to talk about future deployment timelines. It's in the, going to the Indo-Pacific AOR, and I'll just leave it there. And just one quick follow-up, um, are there any plans or conversations to have a two-carrier presence in CENTCOM to replace the TR? I don't have anything to announce right now. Again, you know, the, the amazing thing about the U.S. military is our ability to surge and provide forces wherever we need to. But as I highlighted at, at the top, uh, we have a significant amount of capability in the U.S. Central Command and, and U.S. European Command areas of responsibility. Let me go to the side of the room. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, General. Um, recently, the United States and Greek Cypriots have signed a bilateral defense agreement, and Turkish foreign and defense ministries have, quote, strongly condemned, unquote, the uh, signing of this agreement. The U.S. has historically taken a neutral and impartial position on the island. Would you now say that the U.S. has done away with that impartiality? Uh, I, I appreciate the question. I'd have to refer you to State Department to discuss the, the diplomatic discussions on that. Um, but the Department of Defense has signed this agreement and the assistant um, secretary was there this week. So what does it say from a military perspective, from the DOD perspective, that this was signed? And how does it change the U.S. Um, military 
presence in that region. This yeah. is basically U.S. based right now. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me take your question. And we'll come back to you on that. Thanks, Ellie. Um, how much money is left uh, from the supplemental for the presidential drawdown, and does that money expire at the end of the month? Yeah. Thanks, Ellie. Um, so, so broadly speaking, um, it's important to remember that that when we talk about presidential drawdown authority, it's exactly that. It's the authority to spend monies uh, within the, the DOD budget and the supplemental. And so at the end of the fiscal year, uh, those authorities uh, would expire. Uh, and so right now, uh, we're continuing to work with Congress to see about getting those ex authorities extended uh, to enable us to continue to, uh, to draw down uh, packages and so in the meantime you're going to continue to see drawdown packages um, but we'll have you know much more to provide on that in the near future is it six billion uh, let me take that question Janie thank you General two questions North Korea and Russia first question following North Korea's continued garbage balloon provocations it launched a multiple short range ballistic missiles into the East Coast early yesterday, the day after the U.S. presidential debate. Do you think there is a possibility that North Korea will use additional provocations to interfere with the United States presidential elections? Um, you know, look, I'm, we obviously uh, saw the DPRK's uh, launching of those those missiles. Uh, I would refer you to indo paycoms statement on that. We certainly condemn that kind of destabilizing action. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Russia. Russian Ministry of Defense said it could use nuclear weapons if Ukraine attacked the Russian mainland with the U.S. long-range missiles. What is your reaction on this? Yeah, well, this kind of nuclear saber-rattling saber isn't new. Uh, it's very irresponsible. It's dangerous. Uh, you've heard Secretary Austin highlight the fact that this is not the kind of uh, language that a nuclear-armed uh, large military country that's nuclear armed with a large military should be uh, saying. Uh, all that to say, uh, we have not seen anything at this point that would uh, indicate that we need to adjust our strategic force posture. So we'll continue to monitor that. But uh, at this point, there's been no change to our, our posture. Let me go to the phone here. Uh, Missy Ryan, Washington Post. Hey, Pat, thank you. I'm just going to ask you a question you've been asked uh, previously in the past week uh, about Iraq and the statements by the Iraqi government about the uh, apparent agreement to withdraw U.S. forces over the next two years. Are they accurate? And and um, I know you've said that you, you can't confirm that just now. Um, can you, number one, is that still the case? And number two, can you talk about what has been agreed to in principle? Is it accurate to say that the U.S. and Iraq have agreed in principle to withdraw all U.S. forces is just a question of when and how? Um, that's my understanding. Just want to make sure that that's correct. Yeah, thanks, Missy. Uh, so yes, to answer your question uh, with your question, uh, I, I don't have anything new to announce. Um, you know, uh, as we've highlighted, we have been discussing uh, with our Iraqi partners um, what the transition uh, to the from the global coalition uh, in Iraq, uh, what what that transition would look like to an enduring bilateral security partnership between the U.S. and Iraq would look like. Um, again, we'll keep you uh, fully informed when we have something to announce. But as of right now, I do not have any updates to provide. Thank you. Uh, let me go to uh, J.J. Green, WTOP. General, thank you. Um, Ukraine's President Zelensky said a, a little earlier today that they believe Russia's begun a counteroffensive in the Kursk region. And I'm interested in knowing what you, the Pentagon, think this means for this conflict uh, when you consider what we've learned from, your, from, from the building and from uh, U.S. intelligence about Russia 
gathering weapons as well, including ballistic missiles from 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 Iran in recent days and how this impacts the future and the U.S. plans to support Russia. Yeah, thanks, JJ. Um, so, uh, you know, what we have seen is uh, Russian uh, units uh, beginning to to try to conduct some type of counter offensive uh, in the Kursk region. At this stage, I would uh, say that it's, uh, you know, marginal, uh, but something obviously that we're, we're keeping an eye on. Um, and then I'm sorry, the second part of your question. Just, um, you know, how how the building might view this this activity, what you just mentioned, what you've seen in in the context of getting these weapons, which um, we were told this week, the U.S. has proof of from from Iran, the ballistic missiles. And, you know, there are other plans to to, to try to essentially attack Ukraine's energy uh, infrastructure as winter comes. Sure. Um, so so first of all, you know, um, with the caveat that I'm not going to discuss intelligence from the podium here, nor am I going to provide a, a daily update on Russian employment of various capabilities. Uh, as of right now, we have not seen them employ uh, those Iranian missiles yet, uh, although one can expect uh, that they would in the in the relatively near future. Um, but again, if you take a step back here in terms of of um, what we're focused on, it's on enabling Russia to defend its sovereignty and deter future Russian aggression. So both urgent needs and long-term needs. And as we go into the winter, uh, making sure that they have the capabilities from an air defense standpoint uh, to protect critical infrastructure like energy infrastructure, uh, which we know the Russians are targeting, um, but also at the same time that they have the uh, capability they need on the on the front lines like armor and artillery, ammunition, uh, to be able to check uh, any type of Russian operations, uh, for example, near Pokrovsk, um, and, and elsewhere in the battlefield to include in the, the Kursk region. So it'll ultimately be up to the Ukrainians uh, as they design their uh, campaign plans on, on how they're going to employ those forces. Uh, but certainly our focus is on ensuring uh, that they win and that they have the upper hand uh, when and if they decide they want to go to the negotiating table. Let me go to uh, Howard Altman. Hey, thanks, Pat. I, I want to drill down a little further on uh, Tyre's question about um, the uh, Syrian, the Israeli raid in Syria. Did, did the Israelis inform the U.S. either before or after that raid that was being conducted? And Given that they are a CENTCOM member and also receive a great deal of U.S. aid, should they inform the U.S. either before or after that this raid took place? Yeah, thanks, Howard. Uh, again, I mean, I've seen that press reporting, but for any questions as it relates to any Israeli operations, I'm, I'm really just going to have to refer you to them. I, I just don't have anything to provide on that. Let me come back to the room. Yes, sir. Hi, um, for the, Daniel Compagnangelo for the Italian Television. Thank you, General, for taking the question. I have a, a question regarding the, um, the strike of the Israeli on the school in Gaza um, a few hours ago. Okay. There were some reports, um, like um, we read in Europe some report about France and Germany and the Great Britain deciding to uh, provide less weapons uh, from now on to, to Israel because of this, because of this fact that keep happening. Um, what is the position of the U.S. in light uh, from the military uh, perspective in light of what just happened. If you have anything to say. Sure. Um, so, so a few things. So first of all, I don't, I don't have any information to provide on, on the particular uh, strikes that you're referencing um, other than to say that from the very beginning of Israel's uh, operations, we've been very clear about the importance of taking civilian safety into account, both from a planning and operations standpoint. Uh, and both publicly and privately, and I would point you to Secretary Austin's public comments and to the readouts that we've issued. This is a topic of frequent discussion between him and his Israeli counterpart. Uh, the bottom line is we believe that Israel has both a strategic and a moral imperative uh, in terms of protecting civilians. I will also highlight, though, uh, that there is culpability on the side of Hamas in terms of their uh, tactic, techniques, and procedures of embedding their operations within civilian infrastructure to include schools, hospitals, mosques. Uh, we just recently saw, you know, when they executed six hostages uh, and their tunnel network underneath Gaza, uh, the extensive amount of 
infrastructure, money, resources that they've spent on building this massive tunnel network, uh, which is approximately the size of New York City. Uh, and instead of using those funds and using those uh, resources to help the Palestinian people, they've instead created a, a tunnel network to conduct combat ops from. This is the challenge that Israel is up against. Um, we do not want to see any civilians killed in this conflict, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli, and we'll continue to work towards that. This is why a ceasefire deal is absolutely essential now, and getting all of the hostages released immediately is so important, and we'll continue to work towards that. Thank you. Tony? A couple questions. Uh, does the fact that the United States now has a one carrier presence in the Middle East, and the AO Middle East, the normal presence, by the way, is that an indication that you feel that the temperature between Iran and Israel has dropped and the threat from Iran to Israel is less than it was a month ago? Well, what I would say, Tony, you know, just like I highlighted at the top, um, we, we are going to take any potential threats very seriously. Um, and again, Iran has indicated that they uh, want to retaliate uh, against Israel. And so we're going to continue to take that threat very seriously. And we're going to continue to maintain a robust presence uh, in the Central Command and European Command AORs. Uh, and so that's not going to change. And we're going to, again, uh, maintain, as we always have, the ability to surge forces or capabilities anywhere in the world we need them when we need them. But what's the rationale for moving the, the carrier group then back to the Indo-Pacific? Well, I mean, you know, uh, again, broadly speaking, uh, you know, when, when you look at uh, fleet management, you've got to take into account um, things like the readiness of, uh, you know, our various ships, aircraft. And so that's always going to be something that's that's worked into the calculus. Um, and so you're going to always see things coming and going out of the theater based on uh, those kinds of considerations. But also, as we demonstrated, we have the ability to uh, provide dual coverage should we need to do that. Can I ask you a question on the continuing resolution that the Secretary warned about the other day? Sure. You've lived under this umbrella for a number of years. What stake does the individual sailor, soldier, airman, and uh, space cadet person have in the fight? Will they not be paid over a continuing resolution period, or is it a question of them not getting raises? I mean, what is their individual <coughs> stake, if you can clear that out? Yeah, so first of all, uh, in the event of a continuing resolution, uh, military members will get paid. I mean, that is a legal requirement from the Congress that they will get paid. Uh, but I think it's important to highlight um, because there are no funds available uh, and, and because the, the baseline budget would not change, uh, that would force offsets, force us to offset the costs of these well-deserved pay raises, uh, and it would cut into other programs and accounts uh, at potentially damaging levels. And so, again, we would encourage uh, the Congress to pass a budget. Um, but the bottom line is uh, military members uh, and our civilians will get paid. But their salaries then would be offset, the other accounts would be offset to pay for their continued salaries. Like correct. Like procurement and O&M. That's and correct. That's correct. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Chris. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, you've highlighted the, the threat of these uh, short-range uh, ballistic missiles provided by Iran. Um, does the Pentagon believe that um, U.S. systems provided to protect against ballistic missiles would be effective against these Iranian? Systems? Well, I, I, Chris, I would tell you that it's not just U.S. systems. They're, the international community has rushed air defense capabilities uh, and training to the Ukrainian armed forces. And so uh, this is really an international effort to support Ukraine uh, and their integra integrated air defense capabilities. And that's something that we're going to continue to look at to enable them to defend against those kinds of missiles uh, and the other threats uh, that, that Russia has employed. You know, and, and don't forget, you know, uh, this isn't Iran's entree into this conflict. They've been providing uh, drones, one-way attack drones, as you know, uh, for a while now. Uh, and so they are uh, absolutely complicit in the continued death and destruction of innocent civilians inside of Ukraine. Uh, and we'll continue to do everything we can to enable the Ukrainians to be able to defend themselves, both on the ground and in the air. Thank you. Yes, Otep. Thank you. I have a question on this new NATO command at the least button that was supposed to coordinate security assistance for Ukraine. Has it begun its operation? Do you have any details or updates on that? 
Um, so uh, that's really a, a question for NATO. Uh, you're talking about NSATU, uh, which is the, the NATO element. Um, my understanding is that, that yes, they have begun. Um, but uh, again, I'd refer you to NATO for any details. One more on the air defenses for Ukraine. The Patriot battery that was announced by the president in July, has it arrived in Ukraine? Uh, is there additional training? So what was the status of that delivery? Yeah, so uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate for operation security reasons, I'm not going to talk about the movement of Patriots other than to say that, A, we'll let the Ukrainians talk to their level of comfort about what capabilities have arrived in the country and you know, we'll defer to them on that. But B, uh, we are going to, as we have from the very beginning, continue to work with the international community to rush those capabilities there as fast as we can. Thank you. Time for a few more. Ryu. Thanks so much. Um, <coughs> the question is about Okinawa. Um, yesterday, the governor of Okinawa, Tamaki, met with officials at the Pentagon and the State Department, and the governor expressed his concerns about recent alleged sexual assaults by U.S. service members in Okinawa and a lack of transparency in these cases. So could you please provide a comment on this meeting and on how the U.S. and Japan can improve transparency in incidents in Okinawa? Yeah, no, I really appreciate the question. And, and you know, as we've said before, um, the alleged behavior of these service members in no way reflects the core values of the U.S. military, uh, nor does it represent the conduct of the overwhelming majority of U.S. personnel who are based in Japan uh, that we have forward deployed. And so we do share uh, the concerns of the local community regarding these cases. Uh, we are deeply troubled by the severity uh, of the allegations, and we absolutely regret the anxiety this has caused. Uh, I do know that the respective units are working uh, very closely with local authorities to investigate the allegations thoroughly while at the same time ensuring the, the due legal process under applicable laws and agreements. Uh, and I would uh, refer you to U.S. Forces Japan for any further questions on that. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, my first question is about Pakistan's uh, role in the Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. Uh, as I'm sure you know that China has invested big uh, billions of dollars there in the seaport, and uh, their weapon is mostly now Chinese as well. Uh, is there any other role of Pakistan from a military point of view you see besides the terrorism uh, operations that you guys conduct? Uh, well, I mean, that's really a, a question for Pakistan to address, certainly, as you know. Uh, we we uh, value Pakistan as a partner, uh, and uh, we'll continue to look at ways that we can work together towards regional security and stability, uh, but I don't have any specific announcements to make. Thanks. Just one more to, uh, in Pakistan, they have started, <coughs> Pakistan military has uh, just used a new name for the Taliban in Pakistan, something like Fitna Khwariji. Uh, and that reminded me of Shakespeare quote, which said that, what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So just to America, their uh, change of name makes a difference. I mean, a terrorist organization, what else? Yeah, I mean, I, that's really, uh, again, a uh, question for uh, the Pakistani government to address. I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, what's really a domestic decision on, on terminology, but okay. Last question, yes, sir. Thank you so much, General. Uh, can you provide us some details about the uh, Pentagon uh, delegation that talks with Chinese? Uh, the details, I'm sorry, in the... Yeah, uh, 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 a delegation from the Pentagon is going to hold a meeting with uh, Chinese partners uh, in, in, in China. So that's the Pentagon's website says. Are you talking about the uh, Zhejiang Forum? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, we did send a representative. Uh, we responded to an invitation from the, the PRC. Uh, and so, um, yes, we did. We did. And we've done that in the past as well. So, so is, there a, is there any uh, indications that uh, uh, the tension is going to uh, be uh, uh, no like before that in, in, in some certain points many uh, many people were talking about a possible war or something or a cyber war between uh, the United States and China or Taiwan so do you think that is not uh, a high possibility anymore well you know look uh, secretary Austin's been uh, pretty clear uh, you know we we do not believe uh, that uh, 
conflict is inevitable or imminent. Uh, our focus is on maintaining open lines of communication uh, to prevent potential uh, you know, miscalculation or from competition from veering into to, uh, conflict. And so um, I think that these types of venues are very important to en enable that communication to continue. You know, as we talked about earlier in the week, uh, you had the Indo-Pacific Command commander talking to uh, his theater counterpart. Uh, and so we'll continue to look at, at those kinds of opportunities to keep those lines of communication. At the end of the day, what we're focused on is working with uh, partners throughout the region and throughout the world to ensure security and stability, uh, peace and prosperity uh, for everyone. And so we'll just leave it there. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.